Greetings everyone to the second part of our 19th lecture in our probability and statistics course. So the same comments about the date apply. This is technically the lecture for last Wednesday and a second lecture will be posted later today which you are free to enjoy anytime between now and Friday. Today we are going to, or in this part rather, we are going to speak about what are called minim minimum variance unbiased estimators. So last time we talked about point estimators. A point estimator is a statistic, theta hat, used to guess a value for theta, a population parameter. So there's some population parameter you're interested in. Commonly that will be mean or variance. It could also be things like mode or maximum or second moment. But there is some number associated with the population that you're interested in. And you have a little machine which can generate guesses as to what that population parameter actually is. So your statistic, you feed it a sample, a set of observations you've made, and it spits out its best guess as to what the value for the population parameter is. So these point estimators, they are statistics. More specifically, they're ways of turning samples into guesses about the value of a population parameter. But some guesses are better than others. And there's lots of different ways to generate point estimators for population parameters. There's something called a minimum variance unbiased estimator. <clears throat> there's something called a maximum likelihood estimator, which we would absolutely talk about if this course was split into two terms. We would spend a fair amount of time talking about MLEs. They're a good one and an important one. There's lots of others. There's the best linear unbiased estimator, and there's a slew of others. If you look at the Wikipedia page for point estimation, you'll see a list that includes these and others. Our focus is gonna be on the first element of this list, minimum variance unbiased estimators, abbreviated as MVUE. So what do we mean by this, or how is it that we come to think about what makes a good estimator? What in our estimation makes a good point estimator? So the first thing that we want from our estimators is that they be unbiased. What do I mean about un by unbiased? So the definition of an unbiased estimator, an estimator theta hat for a population parameter theta is called unbiased if the expected value of theta hat is in fact theta. So remember that point estimators, they are statistics and statistics by definition are random variables. So the actual value of your point estimator is a random quantity. It's gonna depend on what sample you happen to observe, what the, op what the values of your sample happen to be. So if I take a sample of size 10 and I create sample mean, a point estimator for population mean from that sample, I'll get some number. If I take a different sample of size 10, it's likely that the sample mean will be different. So my estimator is in fact a random quantity and we call such an estimator unbiased if its expected value is equal to the population parameter we are attempting to estimate. So again, the intuition here is that our point estimator, it generates guesses for us as to what the population parameter is. We would not want those guesses to be on average too high or too low. So if this little machine, which generates guesses for us, you feed it a sample and it spits out its best guess for theta, if it consistently guesses too high, we're gonna call that a bias built into the estimator. So it's not a great estimator, it is on average always guessing values that are too large, bigger than theta. Likewise, if it consistently generates guesses that are less than theta, then it's got a bias in the other direction. It's got a negative bias, we might say. So it's consistently guessing values that are too low. Those are both biased estimators. An unbiased estimator is an estimator whose guesses are on average right on theta. So it may guess too high once, it may guess too low once, but on average it doesn't guess too high any more often than it guesses too low. So it's not necessarily gonna get it right every time, but the guesses that it makes are at least centered on the true value theta. I like to use an analogy of throwing darts for these situations or for exploring these ideas. So we've got a dartboard and the bullseye in our dartboard is the actual parameter value theta that we are attempting to discern from looking at samples. Every time we throw a dart at the board, that's us making a guess. That's us engaging our estimator, feeding it a sample and getting out its best guess based on that sample. So. Hitting bullseye means you actually guessed correctly. You're not generally gonna hit the bullseye every time. There's gonna be some spread 
in your guesses. If all of our dart throws are at least centered on the bullseye, then that's an unbiased estimator. But if we're consistently throwing our darts off to the right of the bullseye, which is shown in the second picture here, that's equivalent to dealing with a biased estimator. Not only are you not guaranteed to hit the bullseye every time, but in fact, on average, your guesses are all too far to the right for the most part. And it's possible for a biased estimator, we could see one or two guesses over here to the left of it, but the bulk of them and their center in a probabilistic sense, in the sense of expected value, would be over here to the right of the bullseye. So this is what an unbiased estimator looks like. It need not hit the bullseye every time, but at least its guesses are centered in the right place. Versus a biased estimator, which is like if we think of these as rifles instead of darts, then people talk about a gun pulling to the right or pulling to the left, and that's equivalent to a biased estimator here. Our throws are consistently off to the right, so this estimator has a bias built into it. In fact, if you know that your estimator is biased, and better still, if you know what the bias is, or can at least estimate the bias, then you can correct for it. So if I know that my rifle consistently pulls off to the right about this much, I might aim for this spot here, and then hopefully hit somewhere closer to the bullseye, or at least have all of my shots centered around the bullseye in that case. So it is possible, if you have an estimator of known bias, to build in a correction and thereby generate an unbiased estimator. We are not going to spend much time on point estimation. We're actually going to wrap up the topic this lecture. It may pop up a few other times as we're thinking about confidence intervals, but this is a topic that we are abbreviating. So many things I'll just mention in passing, and had we another 15 weeks of this course, we would definitely explore some of those ideas in greater detail. But this is what it looks like for an unbiased and a biased estimator. This might be my buddy Miles playing darts, and this is me trying to throw darts over here on the right. All right, so there are some very common unbiased estimators that we have already discussed, but now that we have this terminology in place, we can refer to them as unbiased estimators. If you have any population whatsoever, then the sample mean is an unbiased estimator for the population mean, and sample variance is an unbiased estimator for population variance. So these two most obvious and most common estimators are both unbiased estimators. And it's worth noting that this works for any population whatsoever. It's a very general theorem, even more general in some sense than the central limit theorem, though less important. But there are no restrictions placed on the population here. Populations are always countably infinite collections of IID random variables. That's all built into the definition of a population. But if you have that minimum amount of context established, nothing else is required of the population. They don't have to be normal random variables. They don't have to have finite variance. There's no further restrictions placed on them. It works for any population. Sample mean is always an unbiased estimator of population mean, and sample variance is always an unbiased estimator for population variance. Uh, the second note is that this is the real reason for the n minus 1 in the denominator of sample variance. This is the reason for Bessel's correction, is that it's that denominator of n minus 1. Early on, people used an n in the denominator for sample variance. And still, it's worth noting that sometimes when people talk about sample variance, you have to ask exactly what they mean, because in some contexts, Someone might talk about sample variance, and there might be an n in the denominator. There might be the n minus 1 that we're using for our definition, and in some sense is the best definition for sample variance. There are reasons sometimes to see an n minus 1.5 in the denominator, and we'll talk just a bit about that later in the lecture. But what is meant by sample variance is not universal. What is meant by sample mean is universal. What is meant by sample variance usually includes Bessel's correction, the denominator of n minus 1, but do take note that that is not universal notation. That's not a universal definition. So early in our development of statistics, there was an n in the denominator for sample variance. Bessel realized that that resulted in a bias if sample variance was to be used as an estimator for population variance. And so he introduced Bessel's correction, which replaces the n in the denominator with the n minus 1. It's that n minus 1 in the denominator that is needed to make sample variance an unbiased estimator for population variance. <clears throat> the intuition here is that these guesses are, on average, neither too high nor too low. 
So if you take sample mean as your best guess for population mean, you can have a population that you're studying. Suppose that you're looking at newly born stars of a certain type and you're measuring their core temperature somehow. So you might want to know what is the average such core temperature. And you look at 100 different stars of this type and you take their average temperatures and you use that as your estimate for the population mean. So you think that the average of these 100 stars at their core, the temperature at their core, is going to be close to, or I'm going to use that as my best guess for, the average of the core temperature of all such stars. If you take a different 100 stars, you'll likely get a different estimate. If you take yet another 100 stars, you'll likely get a different estimate. All of these estimates, all of these different values for sample mean, taken for different samples, they will end up being scattered around the true mean in such a way that their average is close to the true mean. So we'll have just as many that fall to the right of the true mean as we would to the left. Just as many guesses that are too high as are as guesses that are too low. The same number of guesses is too high as number that are too low. So they make a, an unbiased estimator. On average, using sample mean to estimate population mean results in estimates of population mean that are expected to be population mean itself. And likewise for sample variance used to estimate population variance. If you take a bunch of different samples, you calculate sample variance for each of them, that's a bunch of different guesses for your population variance. And likely your population variance is going to be centered amongst all of those guesses. It's not the case that your guesses will be too high consistently, nor will it be the case that they will be too low consistently. Instead, the expected value of sample variance is population variance. So these are both great guesses in that sense. They are unbiased estimators of the respective population parameters. And this holds very generally. Again, there is nothing required of the population. It works for all populations. It, it works because it is a very, a very basic, it, all of this only depends on some very basic properties of the integral. So if you remember expected value is population mean, variance, population variance is also an expected value of a more elaborate expression, but there are some very basic properties about integrals that mean that this theorem works for all populations. So first and foremost, we prefer unbiased estimators. Once we have established that we have unbiased estimators, there may be multiple unbiased estimators that are possible, and in general there are. There will be multiple unbiased estimators possible for most populations. How would you pick from amongst the various unbiased estimators? And the answer there is that among unbiased estimators, we generally prefer unbiased estimators that have smaller variance. So given two unbiased biased estimators that we're allowed to choose from, we prefer the unbiased estimator that has the smallest variance. And again, remember that estimators are random variables. They are random quantities. If I take a bunch of different samples, I can calculate a bunch of different estimates, a bunch of different values for my estimator, I should say, and that's going to result in a bunch of different random values. So when we talk about the variance of an unbiased estimator, or the variance of any estimator, we're just using variance in the same sense that we use the word to talk about variance of random variables more generally. So estimators are random variance, random variables. When I talk about the variance of an estimator, I'm just talking about the variance of it as the variance of a random variable. So variance of theta hat is exactly what we mean here. And what does this look like? If we return to our darts analogy, I have on the left and on the right here two pictures that represent estimators, which are both unbiased. So in both of these images, my guesses, my darts are where they land on the board, are centered around the bullseye in both cases. But on the case on the left, we have what would be analogous to a high variance unbiased estimator where yes, the expected value of my estimator is the bullseye. My darts are centered on the bullseye. The expected value of my estimator is the population parameter. But there's a fair amount of variance in the guesses that I make. So on average, they're centered on the bullseye, but they can vary fairly considerably from the bullseye. So we're seeing a fair amount of distance 
between each of my guesses and the bullseye, despite the fact that on average they're centered. <coughs> Excuse me. So on the picture on the left represents an unbiased estimator that has high variance. On the right, we see an unbiased estimator with low variance. So here, the guesses are centered on the bullseye. More so, more than that, or further, we have these guesses tightly clustered about the bullseye. So there is, on average, a very small distance between the bullseye and each of the guesses that are being made in the second picture. And again, this might be me playing darts on a good night, so my guesses are actually, or my throws are actually centered on the bullseye, but still scattered fairly widely. And here's my buddy Miles playing darts on a good night, where he's hitting the bullseye consistently and never going outside the first ring here in this picture. Which, that's not actually how darts work, but we will simplify the game of darts for this purpose, for the purposes of this example. So, unbiased estimators with high variance versus unbiased estimators for low variance. Generally, we would like our guesses to be close to the true value. So we want them to neither be too high nor too low on average. We want them to be unbiased. Further than that, we would like for them to be close to the actual value, and that would be an unbiased low variance estimator. So I said that given two unbiased estimators, we would prefer the one which had lower variance. Best of all would be to have a unbiased estimator with minimal possible variance, and that's gonna be the minimal variance unbiased estimator. So a minimum or minimal variance unbiased estimator. This is the acronym MVUE. And for a given population, so you've got a population established and you've got some population parameter theta that you're interested in from that population, the minimum variance unbiased estimator is going to be that unbiased estimator having smallest possible variance. So the idea here is that there are a lot of different unbiased estimators if there does exist one which has smallest variance, then that one is the minimum variance unbiased estimator. And in some sense, according to the criteria that we've laid out here, it is the best estimator. There are other ways to think about what makes an estimator good or bad, and that could result in different schemas rather than the MVUE schema and different estimators being considered the best estimator. So there's something called the best linear unbiased estimators we talked about earlier. And so this isn't the only criteria, but under this rubric, under this idea that we prefer unbiased estimators first, and then from amongst those, we prefer unbiased estimators with small variance. Under that criteria for what makes an estimator good, the minimum variance unbiased estimator is the best estimator. And they don't always exist. It's possible that there's a bunch of different estimators and maybe some have smaller variance than others but maybe there's no way to find one with smallest variance. There's plenty of mathematical sets that don't have a minimum value. You can take the open interval from zero to one, for instance. You can have elements of that interval that are arbitrarily small, but there is no smallest element in that interval. And similar things can occur here. You can have a bunch of different unbiased estimators and there need not exist one with the smallest possible variance. But if such does exist, we call it the minimum variance unbiased estimator. And there's at least one very famous case where they do exist and they're easy to find, and that is the case of normal populations. So this theorem concerns itself with minimum variance unbiased estimators for normal populations. And it says if you have a population, but further it's a normal population, meaning that each of these is a normal random variable, because it is a population, we have the IID assumption built in, independent and identically distributed. And that's going to mean that each of these is not just a normal, but is in fact the same type of normal. So a normal with the same mu and the same sigma squared. So we're dealing here with an IID population of normal random variables. That is to say, a countably infinite collection of independent and identically distributed normal random variables. If you have that set up, if your population that you're dealing with happens to be normal, then sample mean is not just unbiased, it's not just an unbiased estimator for mu, it is the minimum variance unbiased estimator for population mean mu. And likewise, sample variance is not just an unbiased estimator for sigma squared, it is the minimum variance unbiased estimator for sigma squared population variance. So you always have that sample mean and sample variance are unbiased estimators for their respective population parameters. When your population further happens to be normal, 
then they are minimum variance unbiased estimators. They're always unbiased estimators. In this, in this case, they're also the minimum variance unbiased estimators. And this is lovely because these are, in some sense, the most obvious estimators for the two most obvious population parameters. And in this context, and under this rubric of what makes an estimator good, these are the best of all possible estimators. I say they're the best estimators in some sense, meaning that you have to be operating under this criteria that it is unbiased estimators you prefer, and from amongst those, you would always rather have a one, a, an estimator with smallest variance. If you're thinking about things like maximum likelihood estimators or best linear unbiased estimators, then those criteria change. But for our purposes, we're thinking about minimum variance unbiased estimators, and these two estimators are such for a population of this type and for their respective population parameters. It is also worth saying as an aside here that it is possible to calculate what is called sample standard deviation. As you might imagine, you just take the square root of sample variance. Sample standard deviation is not actually an MVUE for population standard deviation. So I've said throughout the course that mathematicians prefer variance and engineers often prefer standard deviation. This is one place where everybody prefers variance because you have a nice MVUE for variance but the obvious analog is not an MVUE for standard deviation. It has something to do with something called Jensen's inequality, a theorem that is outside the scope of this course, but which you're welcome to look up. It's got a nice Wikipedia page and a page on uh, math world and so forth. So there's an issue with taking convex functions and expected value and how those two things interplay. So actually sample standard deviation tends to, it's not even unbiased in fact, it tends to consistently underestimate actual population standard deviation. Again, it's something that if you know the degree of the bias, you can account for, you can correct for, or you can just operate at the level of variance here and have your minimum variance unbiased estimator. That's all we'll say about that, but I definitely wanted to throw it out there. It would be easy to try to draw a false generalization of this theorem to a similar theorem that also involves standard deviation, but that doesn't hold. <clears throat> all right. So for normal populations, we do have minimum variance unbiased estimators using our favorite, most famous, most obvious point estimators for two population parameters. If you don't have your population being normal, these are still unbiased estimators, so they're still pretty good. But when your population is normal, they're great, because not only are they unbiased estimators, not only are your dart throws centered on the bullseye, they're also as tightly clustered about the bullseye as you could manage, as could possibly be managed in that case. So there's not a lot of calculation in this section of the course. Again, we are abbreviating the treatment of point estimators down to a single lecture so that we can spend some more time talking about statistical hypothesis testing, and uh, that's our primary interest at this point. So these are the types of questions that could be asked over this material and some of this could be combined with some questions about confidence intervals as we'll see when we study confidence intervals over the next two lectures but this is the kind of question that I might ask for this type of material so let's suppose that you work for the US Fish and Wildlife Service so it's your job to set the catch limits and to monitor the health of some wild populations in the US and to determine how many hunting licenses, how many fishing licenses you're going to issue every year to make sure that the, you are a good steward or that we as a country are good stewards of our natural resources. So you need to monitor the average mass of adult salmon every year. You gotta know how the population is doing. Generally, if we see some problems happening, we're gonna wanna figure out what's going on and try to correct for that. It's your job every year to go out and estimate how the salmon population is doing in the Pacific Northwest, let's say. And as part of that survey, you need to know the average mass of the adult salmon each year. So this year you're going out, you're going to take these surveys, you're going to catch a bunch of fish, and you're going to try to estimate the average mass of an adult salmon. So you go out and you manage to catch 80 fish, let's say. Likely you would use much larger numbers if you're working for U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Well, let's say you go out and you catch 80 adult fish. How would you estimate the average mass for this population? So how are you going to try to average, how are you going to try to estimate the actual average mass of all of the adult salmon in rivers in the US. And in what sense is this estimate that you're making a good estimate? So what's good about it or what do you not have? What, what would you maybe like that you don't have, but what do you have that makes it a good estimate? 
So I'm going to lay out what the population is and what the sample is just to clarify in my own mind what's going on. And again, this wasn't asked for, but it is always recommended that you sort of adapt the word problem to the mathematical machinery as thoroughly as you can at the outset of the problem to strip away whatever is superfluous or whatever is sort of specific to this problem but not actually needed for the mathematical analysis. So um, there's going to be a population here. We're trying to estimate a population mean. We're trying to estimate the average of mass of all such fish. And so my population is going to be made up of the mass of each of these fish. So we're going to act like there's infinitely many. We're never going to catch anywhere close to the total number. So for our purposes, there's essentially infinitely many salmon in the rivers. X1 is going to represent the mass of the first adult salmon. X2, the mass of the second, were we all to put them in a, were we to put them all in a line, there would be a first, a second, and so forth. And so these random variables represent the masses of these fish. And our sample is going to be the first 80 random variables taken from this population. So the mass of these 80 fish that we actually caught. We want to know the population mean mu. And we are going to use sample mean as our point estimator for population mean. We've got a sample of size 80. We massed 80 different fish. We're going to add up those 80 and we're going to divide by those 80 numbers and we're going to divide by 80 to get an average, the sample average. That's going to be our point estimator for sample mean. So that's how we actually estimate population mean. We're going to use sample mean as an estimator for population mean. We were also asked in what sense is it a good estimator well, we don't know that this is a normal population. You could maybe make an argument, but we haven't been told in this, if you know a bunch about normal random variables, they do show up all over the place, partly because of the central limit theorem, but it's it's wouldn't be terribly surprising if they did turn out to be normally distributed, if these fish masses did turn out to be normally distributed, but we haven't been told that in the problem. We have no reason to assume it at this point. So, our sample mean is not necessarily going to be the minimum variance unbiased estimator since our population is not known to be normal. And that's unfortunate, but we do at least know that it is an unbiased estimator. We have that much. Sample mean is always an unbiased estimator for population mean, so even not knowing the population to be normal, sample mean still makes a decent estimator of population mean. So it is in that sense that it is a good estimator. It is at least an unbiased estimator even though it is not known to be the minimum variance unbiased estimator. So let's have you think about one of these. So suppose you manufacture, manufacture processors, so computer chips that are gonna do most of, the, most of the thinking in your computer, and it is your job to manage the heat created by these processors. This is a big part of, of developing better and smaller and faster computers is that they inherently generate heat as operations are carried out and getting that heat moved away from the processor as quickly as possible is a big part of trying to increase performance of machines. So you manage the heat generated by these processors. Part of your job or your assessment here is that you want to know the temperature of such a processor of one of these processors that you manufacture after a fixed number of operations is performed on the processor or by the processor in a fixed amount of time. So if we make this processor go through, you know, in operations in T seconds, then what is the actual temp of the processor as that happens? Generally, the more operations in a smaller amount of time, the more heat's gonna be generated, it's not able to dissipate. And so you're gonna run a processor through a fixed number of operations in a fixed amount of time and measure the temperature. You're gonna take a different processor, run the fixed number of operations in the fixed amount of time and measure the temperature. You do that for 99 such processors. So you record 99 temperatures, the temperatures of 99 processors after a fixed number of operations were performed at a fixed amount of time. And you already, so you get those observations, you get those 99 temperature values. Suppose also that you have done a bunch of in-house testing already. You have a fair amount of experience with these processors and you know that the temperature values are going to be normally distributed. So you already know that your population is normal. You're just interested in what some of the population parameters are. And this is not at all unreasonable. Heat is actually intimately tied to the normal distribution. The normal distribution, normal random variables, do very much describe how heat moves and dissipates. That's actually connected to my own research dealing with Brownian motion. I do it more for... Um, 
like uh, diffusion of biological species. Biological species like single-celled organisms that don't have any modal power, they move like diffusion, like a drop of food coloring in a glass of water tends to move. And that's also how heat tends to move about in different media. <clears throat> so that's really neither here nor there, but the point is that it is very believable that the temperatures of such processors would have a normal distribution. There's a good theoretical understanding of how heat works, and it would make sense to assume a normal distribution of these temperatures you've measured. So how are you going to estimate the variance? Perhaps you want to know how consistent are the temperatures of such processors under such conditions? How would you estimate that? How would you estimate variance for these temperature values? And in what sense is this estimate a good estimate? So go ahead and pause the video, give that some thoughts, see if you can write up a solution, maybe following the example that we just did, and then we will solve the problem together. All right, so the solution here, our population is a normal population where each of the xi is gonna be a normal random variable with the same mean mu and the same variance, sigma squared, those are population mean and population variance. And the ith such random variable represents the ith, the temperature of the ith processor measured under these conditions. So we have our population, which is given by normal random variables of this type, and which where each represents the temperature of a processor. And then we have our sample of size 99, which represents the temperatures of the 99 processors that we actually measure under these conditions. And we are going to use sample variance to estimate population variance. That is not a question mark. That is sigma squared, period. So that's a slightly unfortunate use of notation. Sorry about that. But yes, we're going to use S squared sample variance to estimate population variance sigma squared. And because we know our population is a normal population, we actually know that S squared is a minimum variance unbiased estimator for population variance. S squared is an MVUE for sigma squared here. It is in that sense that it is a very good estimator for population variance. It is both unbiased and it has the smallest variance possible for such an estimator for population variance. All right, and that will do it for part two of today's lecture. Uh, we will move from here to thinking about confidence intervals, another way to do point, not point, another way to do estimation of parameters. So what we've talked about today was point estimation of parameters. Next, we'll move into thinking about attaching intervals of possible values for a population parameter and further attaching different degrees of confidence to the intervals that are offered up. Thank you, folks. Speak to you again shortly.